Hello and welcome to this tutorial. My name is Isaac Kwame Bedu and I am a volunteer in the Insect Museum. I am going to introduce you to the Insect Museum and the activities that takes place in the museum. The museum was established to serve as a repository for insect collections of different kinds. The museum is hosted under the Department of Conservation Biology and Entomology in the School of Biological Sciences in the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences within the University of Cape Coast. The museum currently has several insect collections of different species and different kinds based on collections from student projects, lecturers projects, as well as other interested groups. The museum assists in the training of students in insect systematics, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. The museum also assists in the identification and classification of insects for students' projects, as well as projects by lecturers and then people from outside of the university. The museum also assists in the collection of insects as well as the preservation and creation of insects. So one may ask, why collect and preserve insects in the first place? Globally, there are over 5 million species of insects and each species is specific to its characteristics as well as its function and the role it plays in the ecosystem. It is therefore important that we know each species, their descriptions, as well as their classifications, so that we'll be able to understand the roles that they play within the ecosystem. So for example, let's take a situation where a pest attacks a farm. The solution would be to find measures that will prevent the pest from increasing in population and from causing further harm to the crops. However, to be able to do this successfully, we need to understand the behavior of that pest that is attacking the farm. To understand the behavior, we need to first of all know which species we are dealing with in the first place. This is where identification and classification comes in because every species is unique to their life cycle, to the way they behave, to even the kind of food they feed on, as well as the environmental factors that affect their behavior. So therefore, a wrong diagnosis of a species will lead to a wrong solution that will be implemented. So it is therefore important that we are able to identify each species that is present and then classify them so that we'll be able to understand them better and then provide solutions. In situations where we are dealing with a beneficial insect, that is an insect that provides benefits for humans, we need to first of all understand or know which species we are dealing with so that we can be able to provide a suitable environment for it so that it can continue to provide the benefits that we need. So, we are going to talk about the methods and protocols that we use in the museum to achieve our aim and our objectives. So, the first is the collection methods, which is the means by which we collect the various kinds of insects that we have. There are several collection methods that can be used to collect insects. This method, these methods depend on the kind of insects we are, we are trying to collect. So a method that will be used for, say, collecting a butterfly will be different from a method that will be used for collecting an ant. Some of the methods used for insect collection include aerial nets, sweep nets, pan traps, 
pitfall traps, malaise traps, beating sheets, and even hand-picking amongst others. For each of these methods, there are specific guides that are used to be able to collect the insects of interest. For aerial nets and sweep nets, we mostly use these nets for collecting insects that are actively flying. So insects that fly above and just below the ground level can be collected using the aerial and sweep nets. So for example, butterflies can be collected using the aerial nets. Dragonflies can be coll collected using the aerial nets. Um, grass grasshoppers and several other flying insects and even bees can be collected using the aerial and then the sweep nets. For pan traps, they are usually colored bowls that are set above the height of the vegetation or the trees to collect mostly pollinators such as the bees. So the idea behind the use of the pan traps is that the color simulates that of a flower. So it is able to attract the pollinators to the pan. And then as they are attracted to the pan, they are trapped within the pan because a soapy solution, soapy water solution is placed within the pan so that once the pollinators fall within the pan, they, are, they get wet and they are not able to fly out. Pan traps can be used for different kinds of ecosystems and even within the rainforest. The only challenge is to be able to set it to the top of the trees or the level at which you want to collect the insects. Once that is done, it can be easy to collect pollinators in every kind of ecosystem. For pitfall traps, they are used for collecting insects that are crawling on the ground. So as the name suggests, it is a pitfall. So the traps are set such that they are buried within the ground to be at the level of the ground surface. So that as the insect crawls, they fall within the trap and then they are not able to climb out. To make pitfall traps very effective, we can use baits to attract insects into these pitfall traps. Malay traps can also be used for collecting flight insects. The design of the trap is such that it serves as a flight interceptor. So as the insect is flying, once it hits the Malay trap, it is forced to go upwards towards the sun. And then as it moves, there is a container positioned above the trap that collects the insect with a killing agent that kills the insect. And then the insect is trapped within the container. So these are some of the traps or the methods that are used for collecting insects. Even hand picking can be used in, a, in a, an environment where you are collecting insects that are crawling on the ground. You can also use hand picking to pick the insects into containers and then you can, you can store them and then use for the purpose for which you intend to use them for. So after the insects are collected, we need to store them and preserve them for the purpose for which we intend to use it for based on whether we just want to keep or we want to preserve, or we want to identify, or we want to classify. So, there are several methods that can be used to store insects depending on the kind of insect we are collecting. However, before you can store the insect, the insect has to be killed because we don't want the beautiful insect that we've collected to escape. So, therefore, we have to kill them. For hard-bodied insects, like the beetles, the grasshoppers, we kill these insects by using a killing bottle. The killing bottle is prepared using cotton wool and then a cardboard base. 
with the use of a uh, killing agents such as ethyl acetate. So once the insect is introduced into the killing bottle, the insect is killed, especially for hard-bodied insects. For soft-bodied insects like the butterfly and the moths, we kill them by pinching the thorax to immobilize it because when you use the killing bottle, they tend to lose their wing structures, especially for butterflies. Their wings have a lot of scales. So to be able to preserve those scales and then keep the wings intact, we kill them by pinching. Mostly for the hard-bodied insects, after killing, we store them temporarily in the field using 70% alcohol. Temporal storage is important because you never know where you are sampling. It can be that your sampling area is far away from the museum or far away from the place where you'll be doing your permanent storage. It is therefore important that you store them temporarily to make sure that the integrity of the specimens that you have are kept intact before transferring them to the point of permanent storage. Therefore, for hard-bodied insects, like I mentioned, we use 70% alcohol to store them temporarily on the field. For soft-bodied insects, because we don't want to lose their body parts, we store them in paper envelopes temporarily and then immediately once we get to our destination we continue to store them temporarily using refrigeration refrigeration is important because it keeps the bodies of the insects intact and then prevents it from getting stored getting destroyed before we do the permanent storage so temporary storage is one of the activities that we do after collection of the insects just to recap we collect the insects we, we kill them depending on the kind of insect and then the method to be used and then we temporarily store them on the field before we transfer for permanent storage for permanent storage this involves mounting of the insects on in permanent insect boxes to be able to mount these insects usually a pin is inserted through the right half of the thorax of the insects onto a mounting board and then the insect is preserved this mounting method may differ for each kind of insect that we are dealing with so for an insect like a, a bee or a grasshopper, we permanently store them in positions as if they were to be in the field. Which means that there are some insects that are flight insects naturally in the field. And then also there are some insects that are crawling. There are some insects that perch in the field so when we are doing the permanent preservation by mountain we try to simulate their behavior their natural behavior in the environment so if the insect is a flight insect for example a dragonfly in its natural environment would has all its wings opened so therefore we mount it with all wings open to simulate its behavior in the field if it is a hopping insect we mount it such that it looks as if it is hopping exactly as it was in the field so there are different methods for mounting insects depending on the kind of insect and also on the size of the insect so for a very small insect for which a pin cannot be inserted through we mount them using cardboards so we cut out cardboards in triangular shapes and then we we glue the insect onto the cardboard and then it will be mounted within the mounting box we can also mount such small insects directly 
onto the pin instead of inserting the pin through them. For insects that are large enough, we can then insert the pin through them. And even for the pins, the mountain pins comes in different sizes. So a larger insect will have a pin that is slightly thicker in, 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 in width compared to a smaller insect that would have a pin that is thinner. For butterflies and other insects for which we have to spread out their wings, it is important that we mount them on boards that are specifically designated for such insects. So they are butterfly designed mountain boards that are specifically used for mountain butterflies. After the insects have been mounted, they are then transferred into permanent storage boxes. And within each box, naphthalene balls are placed within the boxes to remove moisture as much as possible. The idea behind permanent storage is to preserve the insect in a very dry state because moisture leads to the formation or the development of moats on the insect bodies which will lead to our specimens getting destroyed. So the naphthalene balls that are placed within the boxes remove as much moisture as possible to ensure that the environment within which we are preserving our insects are conducive and are moisture free for as long as possible. Even before the use of the naphthalene balls, at every stage of the mounting process, we ensure that our insects are thoroughly dried out. So when we are mounting, we use pins that we call them bracing pins to actually spread out all parts of the insect so that each part can get dried properly before they are transferred into the permanent storage boxes. So once our insects are properly preserved and stored, we can now go ahead to work on them in terms of whether we want to do identifications and classifications. So generally we know that insects are in the class insecta and under the class insecta there are several orders of insects like the Hymenoptera, the Odonata, the Lepidoptera and many others. For each order, insects that are grouped under that order have unique characteristics for which we can classify such insects under the various orders. Under each order, there are several families within the order. Under each family, there are genuses and then there are also species for each genus. To be able to classify insects for each taxon level that exists, we need to first of all assess the characteristics of the insect that makes it suitable to be placed under a particular taxa. These characteristics are often morphological. So traditional identification and classification techniques rely on the morphological characteristics of the insects to classify them into their various taxa levels. So for, for classification purposes, these characteristics are assessed. So there are specific keys that have been developed to aid in the identification and classification of the insects. These keys are often contrasting two contrasting statements for which if a if insect A has this character then it means this insect is placed under this particular group. If the insect doesn't have that character the key then leads you to another key that further gives other descriptions for which you can use to classify the insects into their various taxa. So based on these morphological characteristics of the insect, the insect can be 
classified. There are several modifications that insects have when it comes to their morphological features. Even the wings of insects are highly variable. There are insects that have very clear membranous wings. There are insects that have something like a leathery wing, which is called the tegmina. There are insects that have very sclerotized, that is, hardened four wings. And then, like the beetles, for instance, when you see them, you see, you, you see that their, their wings are very hard, as if they cannot fly. But then they have hind wings that are membranous, that aids them in their flight. In their flight. So, just like the wings are varying, the legs, the antennae, even the eyes are also varying for different kinds of insects. Even the abdominal segments are also varying for different kinds of insects. So, these differences in their morphological features help to identify and classify the insects. Apart from the morphological features that the insects have, we can also use morphometric techniques which deals with uh, the measurements of the various morphological features of the insect. So, for example, we can do a morphometric of the insect wings where we compare one wing to the other. So, we take specific measurements in terms of the length of the wings or the width of the wings or the texture of the wings. And even we can also use landmarks, that is coordinates, to differentiate between one insect and the other at different levels of classification. We can also go ahead to use molecular techniques that deals with assessing the DNA of the insects to identify their uniqueness in terms of their genetic makeup. These techniques can also aid in the identification and classification of insects. So for each insect group there may be different keys that are designed specific to that particular insect group. So the keys for identifying insects under the other odonata will be different from the keys that are used for identifying the insects of the other hymenoptera or let's say lepidoptera. So scientists usually come up with keys for that helps in this identification from time to time. As I mentioned in the introductory portions of this tutorial, identification and classification are very important to help in understanding which kind of insect species we are dealing with and also help to understand their roles that they play within the ecosystem. If it is an insect, that causes harm to us based on the identification and classifications that we've done we can go ahead to find lasting solutions that would help to control such insects so the activities that takes place in the museum are geared towards helping humanity they are geared towards helping society and helping science to develop and to grow so Students utilize the services of the museum, lecturers utilize the services of the museum, as well as other interested parties that are within and outside of the university all utilize the services of the museum. So the museum is an important component when it comes to the teaching of biological sciences and entomology within the university. Thank you very much for paying attention to this tutorial.